Our next speaker is, is Mark Wright. And we're pleased to have imported Mark Wright from out of the country where he was working. <laughs> Mark Allen Wright was born and raised in Long Beach, California. He served his mission in Columbia from 1991 to 1993. He learned his BA in anthropology at UCLA where he graduated with both departmental and Latin honors, cum laude. He earned his MA at the UC Riverside in 2004, also in anthropology. He is currently a doctoral candidate in the Department of Anthropology at UC Riverside and is in the process of publishing his dissertation. His research specialization is Mesoamerican archaeology and his dissertation focused specifically on the institution of divine kingship among the ancient Mayan civilization. Mark has been named a Nibley Fellow for the past five years by Farms. Before moving to Utah, he was an associate professor at San Mount San Jacinto College and taught early morning seminary for seven years. But we won't hold that against him, right? He's been teaching Book of Mormon part-time in the Department of Ancient Scripture at BYU since the fall of 2007, and he's currently the lead director for Liahona Guide Guided Tours. With that, we'd like to give our appreciation to Liahona Guided Tours, who gave him time off and, uh, and helped him to uh, help sponsor him to come, come here to this conference. So we appreciate that, that donation from Liahona to Guided Tours. With that, Mark Wright. I would just uh, preliminarily like to thank uh, Mike Ash for uh, his presentation. A lot of what he said um, actually leads in very nicely uh, to what I'm going to say, especially concepts of uh, having a paradigm shift. Um, and uh, I hope you enjoy shifting with me here. Am I uh, good to go? All right. Well, it is a pleasure to be here today. Uh, I've been coming to these conferences for several years now, uh, and uh, it's amazing uh, how different I feel on this side of the podium than I do normally sitting down there. Uh, I'm a little nervous, but um, it's, uh, it's good to be here. Uh, now, I was looking at the, uh, the FAIR website the other day, and I noticed that they actually have two different titles for my presentation. One is just sort of a generalized Book of Mormon in Mesoamerica, uh, and the other is the more specific title of um, this one here, Deification, Divine Inheritance, and the Glorious Afterlife in the Book of Mormon and Mesoamerica. Uh, and I'm glad both titles are listed because uh, I'm actually going to need uh, to lay a general Mesoamerican foundation before I can get into the specifics of my topic. Now I'll leave the geography uh, questions to uh, Larry Polson um, and just um, uh, go on the basis that um, the scholarship that's been done suggests that Mesoamerica is the right place. Uh, there are actually uh, a few different concepts I would like to discuss today, and all of them build on each other and, and are in fact interconnected, so bear with me. My ultimate aim is to shed light on the doctrine of deification, the belief that humans can become gods, as taught in the Book of Mormon. But before I can do that, uh, we need to put it into an historical and cultural context. Now, whether we admit it or not, our cultural understanding and even our application of the gospel is often mediated through our culture, as Mike was discussing. Even our mental images of God and his kingdom are heavily influenced by the way others in our culture have described or depicted him. From time to time, I visit the Museum of Church History and Art in Salt Lake City, and I'm always fascinated by the contributions made by members of the church from foreign countries. They depict events uh, from the scriptures and from church history in ways that I never would have imagined. Take this painting, for example. Uh, had I not seen this in the church museum, I never would have guessed that it was created by a Latter-day Saint artist or dealt with LDS themes. The title of this painting is With an Eye Single to the Glory of God, and it depicts this uh, Taiwanese artist uh, interpretation of Doctrine and Covenants section 4, which contains an admonition from the Lord to search the scriptures diligently. Now, I don't know about most of you, but when I think of section 4, this is what I usually think of, right? A group of missionaries. I don't know why Steve Young is in this picture, but he is. Um, <laughs> who knows? Um, but this is what I think of. And so the, I, I certainly don't picture, in my mind, when I think of Section 4, a Chinese man kneeling on the floor examining a scroll. Now, the reason I mention this is because we need to understand that as we search for evidence of the Book of Mormon in Mesoamerica, we need to keep in mind that the people of the Book of Mormon would have used local, culturally significant images to depict their beliefs. That's just what people do. Uh, if Christian art is to be believed um, from the Renaissance period, Jesus and the apostles kind of looked like European aristocrats. We also need to be aware of the use of metaphor in artistic representations 
in both ancient and modern times. For example, uh, this painting is entitled The Rock of Our Salvation. Uh, the ar artist is obviously referring to Christ, and the painting is rich with imagery whose meaning is clear to modern Christians. But would a Christian in Christ's day have recognized it as such? Would an ancient Nephite recognize the symbolism if he were to see it? Conversely, and to my point, would we recognize Nephite artistic depictions of Christ and his gospel? What symbols did they use? What were the cultural artistic norms of their time? As we seek for evidence of the Book of Mormon in ancient Mesoamerica, we must try to think like they did, rather than assuming that they depicted things in the same way we would. Um, the next fun foundational concept I need to discuss is what it actually means to be a god in a Mesoamerican mindset. Unlike our westernized concept of gods as perfect, eternal, immortal, omnipotent, omnipresent beings, Mesoamericans believed the gods were fallible. They were subject to death. At times they were prideful. They were mentally weak um, and um, generally just far from perfect. Uh, and although some great advances in Mesoamerican studies have been made in the past few decades, there's still an awful lot that we don't know, especially concerning the stuff that dates back to Book of Mormon times. Now, to begin, we need to have a clear understanding of ancient Maya conceptions of the nature of gods and the terminology used by scholars to describe them. The term God and deity are used interchangeable in the scholarly literature. They mean the same thing. Uh, and they all refer to supernatural sentient beings that appear in sacred narrative. This is the standard definition used by Mesoamericanists as we discuss their theology. Now I need you to remember this definition because I'm gonna be coming back to it time and again throughout this presentation. Now as I already mentioned, our Western conception of gods as perfect, immortal, and discrete beings simply does not apply to a Mesoamerican pantheon. The Maya pantheon is better understood as a series of deity complexes or clusters which are composed of a small number of underlying divinities, each having various aspects or manifestations. And so a deity complex refers to a variety of distinctive gods that could be lumped together into a single category based on a core cluster of features, usually based on their physical features or their costume elements, uh, as well as their known roles or traits. And so you can have, for example, Itzamna, the supreme creator god. He might have an aspect as a fire god. You might have Chalk, the rain god and he has aspects as a fire god. Gawil, the god of royal lineages, he might have aspects as a fire god. So these separate gods together form a deity complex, united by certain features, and yet they are distinct beings. Now conversely, a single god could be represented with a variety of differing characteristics or manifestations. The god Chalk, for example, which I mentioned, the rain god. Uh, he's often depicted in, as four separate beings. We have the chalk of the east, the chalk of the west, the chalk of the north, the chalk of the south. They're different colors. They have different aspects, but we're to understand them as all as the same being. It's one God who's sort of split into four. Now, uh, their names, their attributes, their domains of influence were fluid, and yet they retained their individual identity. Um, for example, um, one of the principal gods among the modern Chorti Maya, among whom I've done field work, it manifests itself as a solar being during the dry season, but transforms into the, the maize god, the god of corn, during the rainy season. And so, in other words, this one god is either a sun god or a corn god, depending on what time of year it is. Now, to make the matter more confusing, when he's in the form of the sun god during the proper season, during the dry season, he has multiple manifestations throughout the course of a single day. Here's, what, here's how the, the Chorty describe it. They say, they say that the sun has not just one name. The one by which he is best known by the people continues to be Jesus Christ. They say that when it is just getting light, its name is Child Redeemer of the World. One name is San Gregorio, the Illuminator. One name is San Antonio of Judgment. One name is Child Guardian. One is Child Refuge. One is Child San Pasqual. One is Child Succor. One is Child Creator. They say that at each hour, one of these is its name. And so we have this one God, the solar God, who's either corn God or he's a sun God. And even throughout a different day, he can have all these different manifestations. Now, I should note that among the Chortis, San Antonio, and you'll notice that there's a heavy influence of Catholicism. They've taken these ancient saints and they've turned them into gods. San Antonio is a fire god. Uh, San Gregorio emits beams of light. 
uh, San Pasquale as Venus as the morning star. And so it's easy to understand why these distinct beings would form this, this deity complex and why they would be manifestations of this one God. Now, we may hesitate to think of it in these terms, and here's where the paradigm shift comes in. But when we look through the lens of Mesoamerican scholarship, when we use their definitions instead of our own, the Nephites clearly had deity complexes that were composed of multiple gods, as well as individual gods that could manifest themselves in multiple ways. And so, among the Nephites, here's their main deity complex, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, referring to distinct gods that share attributes. Uh, according to Alma, it says uh, this complex was composed of Christ the Son and God the Father and the Holy Ghost, which were nominally lumped into a single category called one eternal God. Now, unlike a Trinitarian concept of modalism, which essentially views the three members of the Trinity as different modes of God's activity, rather than as separate individuals, the Book of Mormon maintains that each deity had their own identity, and at times they were described in terms of their different manifestations just like the Mesoamerican gods. Now Christ clearly has multiple manifestations throughout the Book of Mormon. He appeared as, as an unembodied premortal spirit to the brother of Jared. He was seen by Nephi in vision as an infant, and he descended as a resurrected being to the righteous and bountiful. He is known variously as a creator deity, a destroyer, a rain god, a god of agricultural fertility, like the modern Chorti, they believe he is a solar deity, and um, they believe he's a fire god, or it, the Book of Mormon uh, uh, speaks of him even in terms of a, a fire god, like San Antonio among the Chorti, speaks of him as a king, a god of medicine, a shepherd, and similar to Maya gods, Christ is also metaphorically associated with animals and inanimate objects. He's referred to as a lamb, and even a rock. Now, you'll have to forgive me if this sounds heretical, but according to the standard Mesoamericanist definition of gods that I gave you as supernatural sentient beings that appear in sacred narrative, Satan would also qualify as a deity. This shouldn't be a foreign concept in Christianity. Even 2 Corinthians 4.4 refers to him as the god of this world. As would be expected in Mesoamerican context, there are clearly multiple manifestations of this god in our sacred narrative, um, the Book of Mormon. For example, Satan is variously described as a serpent, a fallen angel, a death god, a ruler of the underworld, a trickster, and a storm god. But because the devil is also described as a church founder, a covenant giver, the head of an earthly kingdom, a shepherd, and a father, one could argue that he and Christ form a deity complex, since these distinct gods shared a core cluster of features. Now, interestingly, among the ancient Maya, we have example of celestial gods and underworld gods who are at once oppositional, yet dependent upon each other to fulfill their respective roles. Now, as Father Lehi taught, there must needs be an opposition in all things, and the concepts of duality and opposition are central to Mesoamerican religions as well. To take the concept of gods in the Book of Mormon a step further, by analyzing the Book of Mormon using definitions employed by scholars to discuss Mesoamerican religions, it becomes clear that the Nephites maintained a belief in a wide range of supernatural beings, which would all be labeled gods by Mesoamericanists according to our definitions. Now to be clear, I'm not saying that the Nephites worshiped multiple gods, but rather their theology included a wide array of supernatural sentient beings that were functionally similar to ancient Maya gods. Aside from God the Father, Christ the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and the devil, the Book of Mormon also mentions benevolent supernatural beings such as angels and ministering spirits, translated beings such as the three Nephites, but it also mentions malevolent supernatural beings such as devils, note the plural, and unclean spirits. Now to be clear, I'm not trying to impose a foreign concept on the Nephites. I believe that they would have viewed these malevolent beings as gods as well, even though they didn't worship them. We know the brass plates contained the five books of Moses, which included Deuteronomy. And Deuteronomy 32:17 equates devils with gods. It says they sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Idols and idolatry are mentioned 26 times throughout the Book of Mormon, and Jacob links idols to both the devil and devils when he says, Woe unto those that worship idols, for the devil of all devils delighteth in them. And Mormon, spe Mormon specifically calls them idol gods. Now, there are plenty of times in the Book of Mormon 
when the Book of Mormon just sort of glosses over these beings. But it might do us well to recognize that each of those entities was in fact an individual, supernatural, sentient being. What would an ancient Maya depiction of God sitting upon his throne, surrounded by concourses of angels, look like? Would Maya scholars recognize it as such, or would they call it a little understood pantheon of deities and lump it together with other little understood pantheons of deities? This is known as a vase of the seven gods. Here we have a god sitting upon his throne, and here we have him surrounded by other gods. For years, we, we've been trying to figure out what this means. Just recently, at the past uh, Texas meetings, um, the big Maya conference we do every year, uh, my advisor actually suggested that these are six aspects of the sun god uh, in his nocturnal aspect. So he's got all these names according to the Maya during the day, but once he goes on the other side into the underworld, he becomes this, this being. But you'll notice it's six aspects of the same god. But, you know, could we argue that this is uh, a god surrounded by concourses of angels? Who knows? Now, as Maya scholars, we still have much to learn concerning their gods. One thing we do know is that each and every city had its own unique set of gods that populated their local pantheon. Now, significantly, the major polities, such as Tikal, Karakol, Naranjo, and Palenque, not only had unique pantheons, but they each had their own distinct triad of deities that were the most prominent of their local gods. None of these major political centers shared the same triad. So this is the Palenque triad, G1, G2, and G3. This is the triad uh, from uh, Caracol. This is the triad from uh, Tikal. This is the triad from Naranjo. You'll notice it. none of these cities has the same three gods as their most prominent. Now, unfortunately, very few of these gods have phonetically spelled names, and so epigraphers have to rely on nicknames to identify them. Uh, for example, the most well understood and extensively studied of all of these is the Palenque triad up here. Um, we, we, as I mentioned, this is G1, G2, and G3. The G stands for God. We gave it this designation because we don't know how to read their names. We, recently, we've translated this as uh, um, Unem Kawil, Baby Kawil. Um, but uh, it's only been in the past few years that we've even figured that out. We still can't read the name of G1 or G3. There have been previous proposals that this is read Hunalye, um, but it's, um, it's a mistranslation, it's faulty. But I want you to think about that for a second. Here we have the most thoroughly studied and well understood of all of the triads in Mesoamerica, and we still don't know what their names were. In fact, we've identified very few gods from the classic period by name, so we continue to call them by the letter designation that were assigned to them sometimes over 100 years ago. Now, triadic groupings were not unique to the Maya at this time. Uh, Non-Maya cities in Mesoamerica also had local, local triads. There's a large number of non-Maya cities in ancient Mesoamerica at the time. What you're looking at here is a rollout of a vase. So this is actually originally circular, and through the wonders of technology, they've, they've flattened it out. Um, this guy is called the, uh, he's called Curly Face from uh, Tiki Sate in, in Esquintla, Guatemala. Uh, and he's a member of their local triad. I couldn't find pictures of the, uh, the other deities, um, but the other ones, we named the three Curly Face, Beady Eye, and Sour Mouth based on their, their facial features. Now, the point I'm trying to get across is that the Nephites would have fit in perfectly well into a larger Mesoamerican religious system due to their belief in a localized tri triad of deities, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as well as a large population of other supernatural sentient beings called gods by Mesoamerican scholars. Critics of the Book of Mormon say that there is no evidence for monotheistic Christianity in Mesoamerica, and to be honest, I think they're right. But what I've tried to show is that we shouldn't expect evidence for that because it isn't what the Book of Mormon describes when viewed through the lens of Mesoamerican scholarship. Now, complicating the problem is the fact that each and every polity had its unique set of gods, and a very generous estimate is that half of 1% of known Maya sites have been excavated. Um, by some estimates, uh, a few years ago, an estimate was made that there were 4,000 sites um, unexcavated, but with modern satellite imagery, that number has shot up by some estimates to the hundreds of thousands. Uh, there's a lot that we haven't dug up. Uh, basically, we would literally have to dig up every site because every site had its own unique localized triad of deities before we could state definitively that there is no evidence for Nephite religion. 
And uh, even those sites uh, that have been excavated, whose gods are pictured or even named in the text, there are only a handful that have names we can actually read. Uh, the fact that we still resort to alphanumeric naming systems like G1, G2, and G3, or nicknaming them curly face, beady eye, and sour mouth, that should give us pause. It should urge caution in making definitive statements as to who these gods were or were not. Now, now that we've established what it means to be a god, let's turn our attention to how one actually becomes a god. This is a belief shared by modern Latter-day Saints and ancient Mesoamericans alike. Now, I'm not going to get into the old world and early Christian concepts of deification because, frankly, I'm a new world guy, and I don't have time for it. Um, I've got enough to worry about. Uh, but if you're interested, uh, there are a couple of books published by Farms. Uh, one is called Deification, the Content of the Athanasian Soteriology. Uh, it helps if you know some Greek, which I don't. Uh, and the other is by uh, Jordan, uh, what is it? Vajda. Uh, called uh, Partakers of the Divine Nature, and that's much more reader, readable. And so let's take a look at the big picture in order, in order to orient us a little bit. Among the classic Maya, it seems that the primary qualification for becoming a god was being anointed king. That was what set you on the trajectory to becoming deified. Now, in order to become king, there are a number, a number of important rituals that are associated with the enthronement process. And as I stated, it is the enthronement rituals that basically make the king a, a god, or at least enable him to become a god after death. And so we're going to talk about some of those rituals, uh, enthronement rituals, in a moment. Now, we need to keep in mind that the enthronement rituals did not just confer a political office. They actually endowed the ruler with a sacral quality, a sacred quality. They transformed him from a fully human man into something more, something sacred. Now, you should know that there is currently a debate concerning how divine these kings actually were in life. Uh, one of my dissertation committee members believes that the Maya kings were sacred and holy, but not really divine in the sense of being a god. And my committee chair believes that they were full-blown gods on earth. Uh, and since my dissertation is a study of Maya kingship, it kind of puts me in a pickle. Um, but uh, I'll figure it out. I keep going back and forth in my mind whether they were gods or not. Yesterday, I, I was like, no, and today I'm thinking, yeah, so who knows. Um, but what is not debated is the fact that these kings were deified after death. They expected to resurrect like their maize god, like their god of corn, and to become deified celestial beings like their sun god. And although, although they are depicted as the sun god after death, they maintained their personal identities from their mortal state. They received the glory of the sun, as it were. Significantly, they did not replace the sun god in the pantheon when they became deified as him. For example, you can have several rulers from the same site who all become deified as the sun god, yet you still have your sun god at the top of the pantheon. So they do not replace the god, even though they become like him uh, in the celestial kingdom, as they would even conceptualize it. Now, the Book of Mormon describes various aspects of kingship as practiced by the Jaredites, Lamanites, Nephites, and Mulekites. And some outstanding research has been done that compares specific ceremonies and concepts surrounding the institution of kingship that are discussed in the Book of Mormon to old world practices and beliefs. But since virtually all of the earthly kingdoms discussed in the Book of Mormon were located in the New World, I think in comparison to the practices and beliefs described in the Book of Mormon to those attested in the New World seems appropriate. Now to reiterate, my discussion assumes that the people of the Book of Mormon lived among the larger Mesoamerican culture. They participated in it. They were influenced by it. But they were not one and the same with it. Uh, I use a lot of examples from the Maya. I'm not trying to say that all Maya were Nephites or even that all or any Nephites were Maya. But we, our best information and data comes from the Maya. And there is remarkable continuity across space and time in Mesoamerica. Uh, and so it's useful uh, to use uh, Maya data. Now, what I hope to demonstrate is that the beliefs and practices concerning kingship in the afterlife that are discussed in the Book of Mormon reflect certain Mesoamerican practices and belief, uh, which I believe adds strength to the claim that the Book of Mormon took place in Mesoamerica. Now, among the classic Maya, supreme rulers of the largest polities wielded the title Kohulahau. Uh, the way it's read is uh, this element at the front is all read Kohul. This is Ahau. And then this central glyph here, this is from the, the city of Copan. We don't know how to read this glyph. We don't know what the name of Copan was anciently. Um, but every city had the same emblem 
here. They all said Kuhulahau, but then every city had their own unique emblem here. And one of the problems with emblem glyphs is um, if, if they don't give us any clues as to how they're spelled phonetically, we'll never know how to read them. It's, it's like we saw a Mickey Mouse head and someone's wearing a sweatshirt. And if it had a D under it, you'd think, oh, Disneyland. If it had MM under it, you would think, oh, Mickey Mouse, right? And the Maya would do the same thing. They would give us clues as to how words were pronounced. And in many, many of the emblem glyphs, they don't give us those clues. And so we just have no idea how many of the ancient cities' um, names were pronounced. And so, again, this, this, this prefix and this superfix um, denote kahulahau, which has been translated as holy, sacred, or divine lord. Now, since we don't have a firm definition, whether it's, you know, holy or divine, um, it, it causes some confusion. Now, e even though there was debate as to how um, divine these rulers actually were during their mortal lives, it is clear that during certain rituals, they stood as intermediaries that bridged the gap between the natural and supernatural realms. We frequently find long dead ancestors that have been deified that are acting as acting participants, active participants in rituals that were being performed by living rulers. Now the problem is, the rulers seldom, if ever, made direct claims to being living gods on earth, but they did clearly depict themselves in direct communion with deities on their monumental art, and by so doing, they emphasized that they had a special role as intermediaries between the human and supernatural realms. Now there are passages in the Book of Mormon that I think suggest the concept of divine kingship was, was known among the, uh, the Nephites. And throughout this paper, I will rely heavily on King Benjamin and the occasion when he passed the throne to his son, Mosiah. Uh, for example, I believe King Benjamin was speaking to the issue of divine kingship when he said, I have not commanded you to come hither that you should fear me or that you should think that I of myself am more than a mortal man. Now, were the concept of divine kingship completely unknown among the Nephites, Benjamin wouldn't need to explicitly caution them against thinking he is more than a mortal man. Now, it's interesting, the great Aztec emperor Motecuzoma, Montezuma uh, is alleged to have made a similar statement to uh, the translator, to his translator, Doña Marina, also called La Malinche. Uh, he says, Malinche, I know that these people of Tlaxcala, with whom you are so friendly, have told you that I am a sort of god, or teule, and keep nothing in any of my houses that is not made of silver and gold and precious stones. See now, Malinche, my body is made of flesh and blood like yours, and my houses and palaces are of stone, wood, and plaster. We get a very similar denial by an Aztec king. Um, Aztecs, of course, were, were much later, but again, there was this continuity uh, in Mesoamerica. Now, it seemed that the Lamanites also had an understanding of divine kingship, uh, as illustrated by statements made by King Lamoni and his servants in regards to Ammon's supernatural power and strength. They thought of him as both the great spirit and a powerful or great king. They weren't too far off. Ammon was, in fact, the grandson of the great King Benjamin and one of the designated heirs to Mosiah II's throne in Zarahemla, even though he refused it along with his brothers, effectually ending kingship among the Nephites. And just as Benjamin had to emphasize his humanity to the Nephites, his grandson, Prince Ammon, had to do the same thing among the Lamanites. Now, arguably, both Benjamin and Ammon would have qualified as divine kings. They both interacted with a supernatural sentient being, with an angel, uh, and that makes them intermediaries between the human and the divine realms. Now, a part of accession rituals, uh, Maya rulers would pierce themselves in various parts. I won't tell you what part he, this guy is piercing. Um, they would pierce themselves with thorns, stingray spines, or obsidian blades uh, with the intention of drawing their own blood. Now, what they would do with this blood is they would drip it on bark paper and then burn it within a sacrificial bowl as they would incense. And the smoke was considered to be both an offering to the gods and a medium for the gods to manifest uh, themselves to the ruler. Now, in this slide, this is uh, from the site of Yashchilan. We have this uh, woman, Lady Shok, who's a queen, actually, and she has her sacrificial bowl with paper that's been, her blood has been dripped on it, and in, there, in another lintel it shows her pulling a rope of thorns through her tongue. And she's bleeding on this paper, and then she sets it on fire, and out of it, she has a remarkable vision of her father. And the story of Abish I could talk about later. Now, blood was considered the most sacred of substances to the Maya, and offering it to the gods was a way to feed and sustain them. In return, the gods would provide rain and fertility for the king and his kingdom. 
The ruler was conducting these rituals on behalf of the community as a whole. Now, Amulek may have been speaking against this practice of bloodletting when he taught the destitute Zoramites that it shall not be a human sacrifice that will save them, for there is not any man that can sacrifice his own blood which will atone for the sins of another. Therefore, it is expedient that there should be a great and last sacrifice, and then shall there be, or it is expedient that there should be, a stop to the shedding of blood, then shall the law of Moses be fulfilled. Now, while there, although there is some evidence that human sacrifice among the later Aztec civilizations served an expiatory function, there's currently no evidence that bloodletting by earlier Mesoamerican rulers was done to atone for the sins of the people. Bloodletting was associated with agricultural fertility, which is linked to the cycle of death and rebirth, but it was not an expiatory, expiatory sacrifice on the behalf of his people. In other words, the king was not paying for the sins of his people. Now, the Nephites living among the larger Mesoamerican culture would surely have been aware of the sacred nature of royal blood and the power it had to bring new life. Now, King Benjamin, on the other hand, emphasized that Christ was their heavenly king and that his blood had a power far beyond that of any earthly king, the power to atone for the sins of the world. Now, Benjamin, uh, what's fascinating, when we read the reaction of Benjamin's people after their eyes are opened to how desperately they are in need of Christ, they cry out, apply the atoning blood of Christ that we may receive forgiveness of our sins and our hearts may be purified for we believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now the question is, who are they crying out to? Are they crying out to the Lord? They're crying out to Benjamin. As a people enculturated in the larger Mesoamerican system, they cry out to their king, who they see as an intermediary between themselves and their God. Now the ritual component of this gathering is sometimes overlooked. The people of Zarahemla had gathered that day not only to hear the words of their king, but also to perform rituals of animal sacrifice and burnt offerings at the temple, according to Mosiah 2.3. And moreover, after hearing Benjamin convey the words given him by an angel, a supernatural sentient being, his people entered into a covenant with God at that temple. Oops. The temple uh, was the favored place for public royal rituals among the Maya. Maya temple complexes were designed with public, public performances in mind. They were designed that, you know, the king is up here and everybody in the plaza uh, can hear him. Uh, I was just here last few weeks actually and uh, w when somebody's at the top of this e even if they're whispering you can be anywhere in this plaza and you can you can hear very clearly what they're saying um, and so it, it was a place of instruction uh, but it was it was designed with public performances in mind whereas private rituals could be performed in the seclusion of royal palaces or at uh, sacred natural features such as caves so they did have both public and private rituals uh, but the Mesoamerican temples really did serve as a focusing lens to concentrate attention on ideal models of existence and behavior. Now, the recently discovered murals at San Bartolo uh, are, are a wonderful uh, addition to the, um, the body of knowledge in uh, Mesoamerican studies. They were discovered accident accidentally by a, um, a colleague of mine. He had just gotten his PhD, um, and uh, he got hired to go just map some random monuments out in the jungle. And so we hired some Maya informants to take him there and uh, he asked them how far it was and they said, ah, oh, you know, a couple kilometers. So he goes out without any water, thinking they'll be back in, you know, an hour or two. Uh, they get lost. Well, he claims they were never lost. He had a GPS. He said he always knew where he was, he just didn't know where he was going. Uh, so, but based, make a long story short, six hours later he was dehydrated on the point of death um, and um, he uh, decided he was just going to lay down and die. He found a, um, found a looter's tunnel in, a, in an unexcavated temple. And he, he went and he just plopped down because there was shade there. And he looked up and he started laughing because he sees these beautiful murals. And he says, at least when they find my dead body, they'll know I discovered something great. <laughs> so, and he did. And he's become world famous. And I'm jealous of him, but um, I'm grateful uh, that he's OK. They had to life flight him out of there. Um, but what's fascinating about these murals, and it's an ongoing project, uh, we're still excavating there. Um, we know that these murals were used for didactic purposes, for, for instruction. Uh, the murals were found at, the, at a temple, and it was in a small room, and they were along the wall, on all, all four walls. Uh, and we, uh, 
we argue that people would go in there and they would be taught by, uh, by the murals. And the themes, the general themes in this temple is themes of creation. I know these are really bad photographs and I apologize, they haven't been adequately published yet, so this is the best I could get. Um, but this is a mountain of creation. This is the sacrifice, I showed you a picture of that earlier, and then finally, there is anointing uh, as king. Now, uh, without divulging anything inappropriate, I will merely state that our own temple rituals deal with issues of creation, sacrifice, and uh, ultimately enthronement. Now, unfortunately, the specific functions of temples is not discussed in very much detail in the Book of Mormon, although it is clear that it was a place uh, for gathering, gospel instruction, including creation themes, a place for sacrifices and burnt offerings, covenant making, a place to learn to pray in the order of prayer, a place where God could manifest himself, a place where kings could address their people, and a place for kings to accede to the throne. Now, concerning accession, the terms anoint and consecrate are both used in association with the Book of Mormon rites of accession, although the distinction is not clearly drawn in the text. What is clear, however, is that someone oversaw the enthronement and effectually places the king on the throne. While there are no Maya glyphs that have been translated as anoint or consecrate, there is an expression that is commonly used that suggests a similar, if not identical, concept. Uh, this is from the recently discovered uh, Temple 19 uh, at Palenque. And uh, the phrase ukabhi designates a hierarchical relationship between two elites and is used in context where one, elite, where one elite individual is overseeing or somehow responsible for the enthronement of the new ruler. Uh, for example, on this text we have uh, this is the ruler here being enthroned. He's be being given the white headband of rulership uh, by his high priest, by his cousin, actually. And they're both uh, impersonating um, gods. Now, interestingly, this, 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 this whole tablet is, is a very long text. Um, and so a part of the, 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 oops, the central portion of the text um, details this ruler's enthronement under the hands or being anointed by his high priest. Now in this section of the text, and I thought I had the translation there, but uh, it says, Iut ho hote mol chumlachta haulel G1, that's the guy, we still don't know how to read his name, ukavhi, under the hands of, under the auspices, the anointing of, yashna itzamna uti tawuchan. And then it, it came to pass on this date, five mol, the G1 acceded to the throne under the auspices, or he was anointed by Yashna Itzamna. So we have this God who's being enthroned by this God. But what's fascinating is it says, uh, it happened on the face of heaven. This is a pre-mortal enthronement of G1. We have a later date where this God is, it gives a birth date. For years, scholars debated, they're like, well, there must be two guys with the same name because how could someone be enthroned before they're born? Does that present a problem for us as Latter-day Saints? Not so much. Oh, there it is. Uh, and then the fifth of mole happens. You want to see it in rulership. Yashna Itzamna tends to it. There's a lot of different translations. It's under the hand of. He tends to it under the auspices of. It took place in the face of heaven. Um, actually, go back here. And so the, uh, the anointing of a new king among the Maya began with a private ceremony uh, held in the royal palace, attended by priests, scribes, and a few select elites. The public presentation of the new king occurred later at the temple, where he would be, be displayed in his full royal regalia. Likewise, according to Stephen D. Ricks, Mosiah was first designated king in a private setting, presumably at the royal palace, and then presented to the people in the public gathering at the temple. Now, for the ancient Maya, the right to rule clearly came by descent from the gods. But often these gods were historical ancestors that only became gods after their deaths. This is, the, this is called Ultra Q from Copan. What it depicts is 16 rulers. This is the first ruler, the founder of the dynasty. This is the second ruler. You have four rulers over here, four on the back, four on this side, and then finally the 16th ruler. And so what we're seeing here is um, uh, uh, Kinichi Achikumo, who's the dynasty founder, passing the torch of rulership to uh, Yashpasa, and they're sitting on their names, by the way, Yashpasa, so that's his name, Yashpasa. Now, clearly, this guy's been dead for hundreds of years, and in fact, he has been apotheosized as the sun god already, and they've got temples built to him celebrating the fact that he's now the sun god, yet here he is as an active participant handing the, uh, the rule 
to the 16th king after him. And so by claiming descent from this deified ancestor, that bolsters his claims. You know, I'm descended from a god, therefore I have authority to rule. And that establishes his legitimacy in the eyes of his people. Well, he's descended from a god, of course he gets to rule. Now, the, um, in the Book of Mormon, rulers placed themselves, or placed a similar emphasis on tracing their genealogies back to their dynastic founders, often back to members of the original party that left Jerusalem. For example, Lamoni traced his genealogy back to Ishmael. King Amaron traced his genealogy back to Zoram. And among the Nephites, the kingdom had been conferred upon none but those who were descendants of Nephi. Even after the institution of kingship was eliminated, many of the chief judges that sat in rulership were Nephi's descendants. Alma, Helaman, Nephi, for example. Even Nephi, the first king among the people and his dynastic founder, is careful to tell us that he is a son of Lehi, who is a descendant of Joseph, ruler over Egypt. Among the Jaredites, Ether traced his genealogy through nearly 30 predecessors, back to Jared, their dynastic founder. What, I, what I've got here, this is a, uh, a king list pot uh, from the, uh, the Khan kingdom. This is, uh, this is sort of the opposite problem we have with Copan, where we know the name of the polity, but we have no idea where it was. So we've been arguing for years about where this, where this whole city existed, and what's fascinating about it is they had a lot of influence. They and Tikal were sort of the major superpowers, constantly battling, and so we find reference to this kingdom all over the Maya area. But what this is, is just a pure king list. This glyph right here is Chamkawil. It means to grasp Kawil. It's another accession phrase. And you, you can see it's just repeated over and over. All this is, is it, it has the date, and it says, um, it has the date, a person's name, they exceeded. Date, person's name, they exceeded. Date, person's name, they exceeded. And so this is just a, just a king list. Now this calls to mind uh, in ether when they're giving genealogies. Now King Benjamin, Ever the egalitarian doesn't rehearse his own genealogy back to a prominent apotheosized ancestor in an effort to aggrandize himself. Rather, he declared that all his people were descended from the heavenly king because they had become children of Christ, his sons and his daughters. For behold, this day he hath spiritually begotten you. All of King Benjamin's people were given a divine ancestor at the temple that day. The significance of, will I'll return, uh, the significance of which I'll return to later. Now, ancient Maya kings had at least two names. They had their youthful or childhood name and a new name received upon accession to the throne. Now, according to Jacob, the Nephite rulers uh, were also called a new name upon accession. Uh, he said, the people having loved Nephi exceedingly, wherefore the people were desirous to retain in remembrance his name, and whoso should reign in his stead were called by the people, second Nephi, third Nephi, and so on, um, according to the reign of the kings, and thus they were called by the people, let them be of whatever name they would. Now, the new names chosen by Maya kings were almost always associated with that of a celestial deity, uh, and it's often one used by a predecessor. And most pr supreme rulers also prefix their name with the title Kenich, which means uh, sun god, the name of the sun god. And by, calling, by naming themselves after gods, they emphasized their divine authority and elevated themselves above everyone else. Now, King Benjamin, again, in an effort to distance himself from the pattern of self-aggrandizement, and to reinforce the, quality, the concept of equality among his people, gave all those that entered into the covenant a new name, that of their celestial deity, the name of Christ. Now, which uh, brings us basically to the focus of my paper. Uh, as we understand the doctrine, as children of Christ, we are heirs to the kingdom, even joint heirs with Christ. And as heirs, we are entitled to all the Father hath, even thrones in the celestial kingdom. Among the classic Maya, Maya to be a god was to be apotheosized as the sun god and to sit on a throne in the celestial kingdom. This is uh, the most common accession phrase is a uh, uh, which means to be seated. Uh, and every time it's used in the glyphic corpus, it refers to accession to some office. Now significantly in the Book of Mormon, uh, the, uh, when the Book of Mormon uses the phrase sit down, and it uses that phrase nine times, in each and every instance, it is used in the context of accession to the throne. We are encouraged several times to look forward to the day when we can sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who we know from section 132 have already received their exaltations and who sit upon thrones in glory. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the classic period rulers 
certainly considered themselves holy, but they never explicitly claimed that they were gods during their lifetime. But after death, they typically resurrect as the maze god and then are apotheosized as the sun god. And these two form a deity complex of a dying and resurrecting god. And it's for obvious reasons, right? The maize, uh, corn, every year it symbolically dies at the harvest and it uh, symbolically reborn each year. And the sun on its daily journey um, is a dying, a metaphor for dying and resurrecting. Now perhaps the most well-known example of the resurrection as the maize god comes from Pakal's sarcophagus at the site of Palenque. Now this scene depicts Pakal's simultaneously, simultaneous descent into the jaws of the underworld. Here's the the scary jaws of the underworld. It represents a centipede jaw. And here's Pakal, and he's dressed as the maize god. He's got the uh, accoutrements of the maize god in his hair, on his chest. He's wearing the maize god uh, netted skirt. And so he's simultaneously dying and resurrecting. Uh, this is one of the more famous examples of uh, being apotheosized as a sun god. This is Kini Chashkukmo, who I mentioned before at Copan on the altar. He was the, the dynastic founder. And what we have here is the face of the sun god between two birds. So this is Kenich, and then Kuk, we have a, a Kuk, the Quetzal bird, and Mo, Maka. And so we have the sun god emerging from a Quetzal bird and a Maka, which symbolically says his name, Kenich Yash Kuk Mo. But it's also telling us that he has been apotheosized as the sun god. He's been merged with him. Now, similarly, the Nephites expected to be apotheosized after death, conceptually merging themselves with both the Father and the Son. The Lord himself in 3 Nephi 28 says, For this cause ye shall have fullness of joy, and ye shall sit down in the kingdom of my Father. Yea, your joy shall be full, even as the Father hath given me fullness of joy. And ye shall be even as I am, and I am even as the Father, and the Father and I are one. So essentially, we're going to form a deity complex with God the Father and um, the Son, Jesus Christ. Now, the ancient Maya uh, associated the sky with the glorious celestial realm and frequently depicted, depicted deified ancestors looking down from the sky band or heaven as opposed to looking up from the dark underworld. Uh, for example, this is uh, Tikal Stila number 31. Uh, and the deceased Yashnu Nain is up here. <laughs> It's really busy, right? It kind of looks like spaghetti. This is uh, kind of a close-up of the, uh, the monument itself. You see the face here. That's his chin, his mouth, his nose, his eye, his forehead, and his ear. And he's looking straight down. But he, is, he has been merged with the sun god, and he's overseeing the accession of his, throne, uh, of his son, um, Siach Chankawil. And Siach Chankawil, this is his face here. His arm is holding aloft the headband of rulership. His other arm is holding a, a deity image there. Um, but um, this, this practice of depicting ancestors or gods overseeing the affairs of earth from the heavens actually has its origin in uh, Olmec art, uh, going back, you know, back to Jaredite times, as we would call it. Uh, in the Book of Mormon, Ammon explained a similar concept to King Lamoni. He said, the heavens is a place where God dwells and all his holy angels. And King Lamoni said, is it above the earth? And Ammon said, yea. And he looketh down upon the children of men, and he knows all the thoughts and intents of the heart. For by his hand, they were all created from the beginning. Now there's a common misconception that the only afterlife expected by ancient Mesoamericans was the dark, scary underworld, known by such names as Metnal or Shibalba, which means place of fright. This is a, uh, an, another vase that's been rolled out. Here we see poor sacrificial victim, he's getting his heart eaten out by this scary god, and there's weird creatures running around. Shibalba was not a fun place to be, and not somewhere you would want to spend the afterlife. Now, recent scholarship has shown that there was clearly a belief in a celestial paradise as well, reserved for those who could overcome the gods of the underworld. Now, evidence from the classic period Maya suggests that only those who were kings or other high nobles could look forward to a resurrection and a return to this celestial paradise called Flower Mountain, or Flower World. Now, I showed you this before from San Bartolo. This is a, an early depiction of, of uh, Flower Mountain. This is a, a big cave, but it's also representative of a mountain. You see flowers and, you know, birds, uh, animals coming off of it. It was kind of this, this wonderful, lush paradise. Now, 
the goal for a king was to be deified as the sun god, but also um, you know, to return to this paradisiacal place of creation and origin. And evidence for the belief in Flower Mountain dates back to the middle formative Olmec, around 900 to 400 BC, and continues all the way basically up into present times. In the American Southwest, they still hold this tradition of uh, a flower world. Now, the, um, the great Mesoamerican scholar Carl Tauba argues that although the notion of a floral paradise recalls Christian ideals of the original Garden of Eden and the afterlife, the solar component is wholly Mesoamerican. Now to Latter-day Saints, of course, the solar component of the afterlife likely feels wholly Mormon, as we hope to be among those whose bodies are celestial, whose, bo whose glory is that of the sun, even the glory of God, the highest of all, whose glory the sun of the firmament, firmament is written of as being typical. Now, if only kings could receive the glory of the sun among the ancient Maya, how do we resolve this with the doctrine taught in the Book of Mormon that all may be saved in the kingdom of God through Christ? King Benjamin gives us the answer. The same rituals that were used to deify kings were made available to all the saints. Give everyone a divine ancestry through becoming a spiritually begotten child of Christ. Give them a new name. Rely on the blood sacrifice of their heavenly king. Put them under covenant at the temple and have them arise from the dust and sit down upon thrones as heirs to the celestial kingdom whose glory is that of the sun. Now in conclusion, accession rituals transformed ancient Mesoamerican heirs into kings. And after death, these kings inherited in a most literal sense the celestial paradise of the sun. Likewise, our ancient Book of Mormon forebears and we Latter-day Saints claim a divine birthright and engage in rituals that are designed to make us kings and queens, even heirs to the celestial kingdom. And as, so, and as Alma so eloquently stated, and then shall the righteous shine forth in the kingdom of God. Thank you. Okay. Uh, you used the phrase, and it came to pass. Was that your translation? or is it standard in the field? It is standard in the field. It's been standard in the field for about 20 years. Uh, for a while, they turned away from it because we Mormons were getting too excited about it. Um, but they've actually reverted back to that translation because it is um, the best. Do your colleagues know you are LDS? Do they still take your work seriously? Um, yes, my uh, advisor and all my committee members know I'm LDS. I've, I've never made any secret about it. Uh, my advisor has explicitly warned me against uh, making presentations such as this, uh, but he knows I teach at BYU and I'm happy there, so there you go. Um, are, there any, uh, are there any initiatory themes in Mesoamerican temples like those in the ancient Near East? One of the problems is we know very little about ancient Mesoamerican temple worship itself. We have thousands of images from Maya pots about uh, palace scenes and virtually nothing about temples other than the, the um, what I showed you at San Bartolo. Uh, what were the Maya kings anointed with? Don't know. You mentioned G1 has two birthdays, one pre-mortal, one is the other. No, he only has one birthday. He has an accession uh, and then he has an enthronement and uh, the accession that they were uh, fairly, fairly close together, his accession uh, and then you know a year or two later he was enthroned but that was in you know thousands of years back. What's your view on whether Quetzalcoatl can be identified with Jesus Christ? Quetzalcoatl has absolutely nothing to do whatsoever with Jesus Christ. Brandt has a great article about that. I suggest everybody read it. We need to let it go. <laughs> if the Nephites were living in Mesoamerica, how come the golden plates were found in North America? In Mormon 6.6, it tells us that all of, the plates, all of the plates were buried in the Hill Cumorah except these plates. And Moroni needed to get him as far away from there as possible because the Lamanites were killing every Nephite who would not deny the Christ. He had 35 years that he wandered, and that's plenty of time to get up to North America and plenty far away from those who wanted to kill him. Do you have a source uh, discussing the relationship between solar, underworld gods, their attributes, rituals, and myths? Uh, the standard work is uh, the ancient gods of Yucatan or The Major Gods of Ancient Yucatan by Carl Tauba, my advisor, written in 92. <laughs> Have I seen Rod Meldrum's DVD? Will I comment? <laughs> That's my comment. Uh, do you expect a Rosetta Stone equivalent to be found at some point, or would it take a Yerman Thummim to reveal clarity about the Maya language? We've actually deciphered the Maya language. That's not the problem, or the, the Maya script. There, it's still, 
millions of Maya living today, uh, it seems that the uh, classic Maya uh, were speaking uh, a primitive form of Chorti no, that we call classic Choltean. Um, and so we can read about 80, 85% of the glyphs. The problem is when they don't give us phonetic compliments, we can't figure out what they say. Should I keep going or just glance at them to pick one? Okay. Um, there's a couple of question, questions about uh, comparing uh, Egyptian and Mayan stuff. Um, this is one of the things where I think a paradigm shift uh, is necessary. Um, I, th I think we can draw some useful comparisons, but since the vast majority of the Book of Mormon is taking place in the New World, uh, I think we need to let go of um, f trying to force too many Old World interpretations on Book of Mormon civilization, especially when we're talking about you know, being hundreds of years into the, the New World. Um, they would have acculturated, uh, they would have become part of the, the larger culture. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you.